We began this morning with the first of 12 eternal questions that we'll be asking this summer from uh, the books of the minor prophets. We'll be at the book of Hosea, the first minor prophet, this morning. So in your Old Testament, you'll find that book. Easiest way is you open up, you happen to come to Psalms, keep going right, you'll find those major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and Daniel. Then you'll come to Hosea, the first of the 12 minor prophets. And so we'll be at Hosea. And let me mention that these sermons will be of a little different type Ordinarily, we go through an entire book, passage by passage in that book, breaking it down in very small kinds of details. But this summer, we're going to do more like a whirlwind, an overview. What we want to do, as it were, is to whet your appetite for this section of the Word of God. Uh, Many of us perhaps have never even read the Minor Prophets. And when we do read them, they seem to come from a different world in a different time. And yet, their questions are age old. Now, we're structuring it much after uh, Mark Dever has done in his book, the, uh, uh, the Messages of the Old Testament, Promises Made, as he overviews each book. It's a wonderful resource. And so I encourage you to join with us. And so each week, the, the, the thing I would encourage is to read the book in preparation. Hosea is one of the longest of the minor prophets, so from here, it'll be much quicker reading for you in that regard. But we're going to read the opening nine verses in Hosea chapter 1, and then we'll look at the book as a whole. Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel." And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will have no more mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. And so ends the reading of God's holy word here. Let us pray. Father, may this word that sometimes seems so strange to us, may it indeed be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher in your greater glory, our supreme concern. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. What is love? It's often confused, mistaken, It's described in a variety of manners. And so we ask that question, what is love? And yet, 
Whatever else we may say about love, one thing for certain today, it is treated as the supreme value of our culture. In fact, we actually reverse, as it were, what the Bible says about God is love, and we talk as if love is God. You call something love, and you've simply justified it beyond all questioning. No defense is needed, no explanation required. So what is it? What is love? And that's the first of those 12 questions we want to address this summer from an often neglected part of the Word of God, these minor prophets. Of course, as we mentioned in some information we've sent out throughout the week, the word or the term minor does not mean unimportant. It simply is referring to the fact that they are short. The major prophets, on the other hand, in the Old Testament are the longer prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel for some particular reasons. In other words, the minor leaguers are not the minor leaguers of the baseball world. They essentially are the major leaguers of the Old Testament. Their message was equally important and equally serious for the people of God as were the larger books. They were written by the inspiration of God's Spirit. And these minor prophets represent the last four centuries of Old Testament history from around the period of the early 8th century B.C. before Christ all the way up through sometime in the mid-5th century B.C., and we know that they were codified as the Word of God into one scroll no later than the 3rd century B.C. In other words, they have been the Word of God since the beginning of their introduction. And Hosea is the first of the minor prophets and most likely was written in the earlier part of the 8th century B.C. And Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel who fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Now, Hosea is one of the oldest and one of the longest books of the minor prophets. As you're aware of, probably, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel, was divided into two different kingdoms following the death of Solomon with the uh, uh, enthronement of his son. Uh, Israel chose to divide and to go after one of the sons, and then you had ten tribes went that direction, and then the two tribes of Judah went after the kingdom of David, as it were. Now, most of the minor prophets do not focus on the northern kingdom. That's because the northern kingdom had already fallen before they began prophesying. Hosea and Amos primarily are the ones who focus on the northern kingdom. Now, what might be confusing as you began reading is that the northern kingdom is sometimes called Samaria because that was the capital city. On a few occasions, it's referred to by one of the most prominent tribes, Ephraim, Ephraim, however you want to pronounce that, like Judah was a prominent tribe in the southern kingdom, but generally and usually it's referred to as Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel was beset with troubles from the very beginning. 
the decades before Jeroboam II, who reigned while Hosea prophesied, were tumultuous times. The nation had gone through king after king after king. And by the time of Jeroboam II and Hosea in the second half of the 8th century BC, the country was clearly in terminal decline. The empire of Assyria, located just north of Israel, was the greatest power of that day. And that empire continually nibbled away at Israel's borders, taking away, threatening to strike the very heart of Israel. Now, while Isaiah and Micah, who prophesied at the same time, were prophesying in the southern kingdom of Judah, Hosea and Amos prophesied in the declining days of the northern kingdom. Now, Hosea doesn't have a really clear outline. But broadly speaking, Hosea can be divided up into two unequal sections. Chapters 1 through 3 contain everything we know about Hosea's personal history. And then chapters 4 through 14 are a collection of prophecies that warn about God's coming judgment as well as sprinkled within there some very beautiful promises of hope. And it's amidst all of these particulars that we learn a lot about real love. So, what does God say to His people Israel in their waning days? And we can find out by zeroing in on just one word in chapter 1 at verse 3, the word married, the word taken. The word married is what it's referring to on a human level. That's what this book is about. A man married a woman. This man is Hosea. Now, who is Hosea? Now, Hosea, uh, verse 1, tells us his father's name as well as the time in which he lived. But the most important thing about Hosea is that God spoke to him and God told him to marry this woman. Who is this woman? We're told in those opening verses as well that her name is Gomer. Now, I don't know that I've heard any girl named Gomer in our time, and I don't know that we likely will, but probably it wasn't anything unusual in that day. We're also told her father's name, but what really draws our attention to Gomer is not so much her name or her background, but rather it is her character. Notice that we're told immediately what this book is about in chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. We have this historical account of God's instruction to Hosea to Hosea's obedience, and then the children that he has with Gomer. Now, after chapter 1, the book fades into a prophecy. The Lord speaks to Israel through Hosea as if Israel was the mother of the people while the Lord was her husband and their father. And the only other time the man Hosea is discussed clearly is in chapter 3 at verse 1 through 3. And the Lord said to me, go again. 
Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. So apparently, Hosea's wife had been unfaithful to him. Perhaps she had even sold herself into some kind of temple prostitution. We're not certain, but whatever the exact situation was, God told Hosea to go and buy her back in his prophecies. And so we just read everything the Bible tells us about Hosea. So what is the significance of this man Hosea and his wife Gomer? Throughout the book, Hosea and Gomer, real characters in history, stand for God in Israel. In much of the prophetic portion of the book, God and Israel are personified as husband and wife, as in chapter 2. But then at other times, all the images are simply dropped, And God talks to Israel directly about himself and about them. On the whole, Hosea's prophecy is dark and menacing. It foretells a coming judgment. Over 100 times in this brief book, you'll find a little word, will, W-I-L-L, as God warns of the punishment that he will inflict on Israel. In verse 4, and the Lord said to him, chapter 1, verse 4, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Israel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And in chapters 4, Through 14, God thunders time and again his promises to punish, to ignore, to destroy, to sweep away, to bring to shame, to withdraw himself, to discipline, to devour, to lay waste, to pour out his wrath like a flood, to tear like a lion and carry off to pour out his wrath like a flood, to catch like a fowler, to ensure their fall in ridicule, to pursue, to send them back into slavery, to burn their cities and consume their fortresses, to exile, to afflict with curses, to bereave of their children, to reject, to disgrace, to deprive of kings and city gates and plans to leave and to repay. Why? Why did God become the attacker of his own people? And again, what does this have to do with love? Therein hangs a story. A tale involving sin, repentance, restoration, and you and me. What exactly then was the state, the spiritual state of Israel at this time? Well, it's really hard to know exactly. It was over 3,000 years ago. But we can't say Exactly. 
But we do know it wasn't good. The Lord tells us in chapter 9, verse 9 in the book, that they had sunken low in corruption. And not only were they corrupt, they were stubborn in their corruption. The Lord said, the Israelites are stubborn. They refuse to repent. They had rejected in chapter 8 what is good. They had rebelled in chapter 10 against God's law. And rebelling against God's law, they had rebelled against God himself, he says in chapter 13. In fact, in chapter 11, the Lord summarizes it this way at chapter 11, verse 7. My people are determined to turn away from me. Wow. What determination. But, but have you ever thought about sin, your sin, as something so personal, something so directly involving God? You're not merely breaking an inanimate rule. God says your sin is turning from Him. Rejecting God's law is turning from God. And He goes on to say that is contempt. Contempt from whom? Of course it's contempt from God. Breaking his law is like the betrayal of a personal covenant, like the betrayal of a marriage covenant. In fact, in Hosea 6, 7, God says, like Adam, they have broken covenant with me. How? What were those acts like? Well, to begin with, their rulers were not righteous. In chapter 4, verse 18, the rulers dearly loved their shameful ways. Chapter 9, verse 15, God says, all my rulers are rebellious. How? How are they rebellious? Well, chapter 12, verse 1, he says they've all turned to trust Assyria and Egypt. But sin now wasn't limited merely to the ruling classes. No, the nation itself was characterized by drunkenness, mocking, and cursing. They lied. They practiced deceit. They stole commonly. In fact, at every opportunity, they were committing robbery, breaking into people's homes, robbing people in the streets. Even in the stores, the merchants were defrauding the people by having false scales. Look at chapter 4 and this catalog of sins. Chapter 4 beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish and also the beast of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend and let none accuse for with you is my contention O priest. You stumble by day the prophet also shall stumble with you by night and I I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack 
of knowledge. Let's pause there a moment as we are reading along. As long they thought as they were breaking the eighth and ninth commandments against stealing and lying, they may as well go ahead and decide and break the sixth commandment against murder as well. And so bloodshed upon bloodshed was spilled in their land. Moreover, they went ahead and disobeyed the seventh commandment, which forbids adultery. Now, Hosea of course, was personally acquainted with how that commandment was defied. Illegitimacy and prostitution were rampant and rife. Now, you have to wonder when you're reading up to that point, how did it get so bad? How did it get so disordered? I mean, after all, these were God's special people. Had he not delivered them, led them, prospered them, give them his law? Oh, well, we read how. Look back at chapter 4, verse 4. Look at the last phrase. For with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, and the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of of knowledge. And because you, priest and prophet, have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. What the prophet Hosea is telling us is that their religion was all wrong. The religious leaders had become cheerleaders for the people's sin. Why? Because they were profiting from the people themselves. The people had become idolatrous. That's what chapter 4 verse 1 says. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of the true and living God in the land. God is simply saying his people no longer love, know, or exclusively follow him and are not faithful to him, much like one should be with a spouse. They have walked away. And that's why the book itself opens with that charge in chapter 1 at verse 2, where we read, Go, um, the Lord has forsaken you. The land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. Go, get away from me. Now the Lord uses images of adultery and unfaithfulness to depict his people's turning from him and serving other gods. That's because adultery and idolatry go hand in hand. Idolatry is that of spiritual adultery. And God's own people, through their idolatry, commit spiritual adultery. And where does that sort of adultery, where does idolatry, where does false worship lead to? We'll turn to chapter 13, and at the uh, end of the book, at chapter 13, Look at this phrase. He, he's talking about them making idols for themselves, metal images made of silver from the craftsmen. And then he says of them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. That's what false worship leads to. That's what false religion does. It turns people 
upside down. It inverts their value systems. What they should love, they hate. What they should hate, they embrace and began to love. And when people have many gods, gods their own hands have made, you can be sure there will be many perversions that follow. So God's special people, chosen, precious, and blessed beyond measure, have fallen to this, had descended to this. They had squandered the blessings of the covenant people of God. They had, as it were, fallen from grace. And look at chapter verse 8, this word of indictment upon this covenant people. Israel is swallowed up. They are among the nations like useless vessels, like a worthless thing. Words of doom, words of tragic fate, words of annulment. And then God's final pronouncement upon them in chapter 9, verse 17, is most faithful when Hosea writes, My God will reject them. They have not listened to me. And 9, 17, they shall be wonders among the nations. The Lord spoke this word of judgment through Hosea. Those whom he had made his special people were no longer his people. They simply were among the nations. Friend, our day is not too dissimilar from Hosea's. Private vices abound. And as private vices increase, society itself becomes more and more vicious. What does this all mean for us? As we read through Hosea and encounter these unfaithful, wrong-loving, prostituting people, we must realize that Hosea's condemnation does not apply to the world out there so much. He's not writing to the non-Christians out there. What Hosea is saying applies first and foremost to God's people in the church. We must examine ourselves as the church and we must examine our own sins as God's people. And we must ask the question, what kind of heart do I have for God? Because the real desires of our hearts are the root causes of all of our actions and the things that we worship. Oh, clearly, Hosea is reminding us that sin presents a real challenge to love, and specifically, it challenges God's love toward us. Why? Because God is holy. And so God has given this word of warning, though, that grace might be discovered. So how can that love be recovered? In chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, love can only be recovered through that of repentance. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. 
Let us know, verse 3, let us press on to know the Lord. He is going out as sure as the dawn. He will come to us, though, as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Well, friend, the empire of Assyria did eventually destroy the kingdom of Israel, just as Hosea prophesied, and they did it within just a few short years of Hosea. Isaiah's writing this prophecy. God's threat of punishment could not be avoided. Why? Because Israel had ignored God too much. They had sinned too grievously. And still though, God would use Hosea to graciously call his people to repentance because, get this, no sin is too grievous that God will not forgive the repenting sinner. But take note, take special note of how God's love is never divorced from His holiness. Now when we come to God in faith in Jesus Christ, God accepts us as we come to Him in repentance. But you take note, God does not leave us in our sin. That's not the biblical picture of God's love. Rather, God's love calls us to join Him in this holy hatred of our sin as well as all sin. It is His holy character that forms and shapes His love for us. His love is the searching love of the Father, the longing love of the husband, that desirous love of the true friend who wants only the best for the beloved. That's the kind of love that God has for us. And so the call from Hosea for us today is repent, confess your sin to him, pour out your heart to him, and he will meet you. Yes, sin challenges love, but repentance offers the way of recovery and the restoration of love then is our hope. Now, Hosea is filled much with warnings of judgment and call to repentance, and yet somehow piercing the darkness of these divine forebodings of doom, there are brilliant glimpses of hope. Chapter 11 is stark, full of them. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called, they they went away. The people turned. He keeps saying, he says, but in verse 8, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. He goes on to say how that He will restore His people. Yes, the old covenant kingdom of Israel was destroyed. So how could God make those promises? There there was no nationwide call of revival and fasting. There was no nationwide experience like that. In fact, as we noted, the Assyrians destroyed Israel. Yes, Israel was destroyed. But did you get these words? Paul, in Romans chapter 9, verse 25 and 26, quotes the words of restoration from Hosea on two occasions as Paul writes. I'm going to read these to you in Romans chapter 9. 
As he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not my beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. That's the restoration. That's the hope that God offers you and me this very day. And that great hope is none other than Christ himself who paid sin's penalty for all of those who would ever repent and believe in him. That's why Paul writes also that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, we're almost done here, but don't miss this. Don't miss, look back at at Hosea 11.1. Hosea 11, 1, how could this be? How can we see that Christ here is found in this? Hosea 11, 1 points us backwards and then forwards, backward to the deep well of God's love in calling Israel out of Egypt the first time. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And then points us forward to an eventual fulfillment. Now in chapter 11, he goes on to tell us that indeed Israel ultimately failed as a son. He deserted the Lord. He worshiped false gods. He refused to repent. And God had warned the people that if they forgot him and they went after the gods of their hearts, he would drive them out of the land. He had told them that in the book of Deuteronomy in chapters 28 through 32. In fact, he gave them a song warning them that they were going to be disobedient. And yet at the very end of of that song, he says, but I will make an atonement for my land and my people. And indeed he did. Because this verse, Hosea 11, 1, is that hinge verse that pointed us backward, but it also points us forward. Because if you'll look in the Gospel of Matthew in your New Testament, chapter 2, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 15, we read these words. Beginning at verse 14, he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, speaking of Joseph, and remained there in Egypt until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So this verse in Hosea points us forward that there was coming a son who would not fail, but who would fulfill the work of God in restoring his people. And it's only because of Christ's payment that you and I can be restored today. Now, as we wind it up, as we've been talking about this people, and we hear these characters, Jose and Gomer, the people of God, how have you identified yourself as you think about it, who, who do you identify with? Is it, some would say, Hosea? I mean, after all, God called him to love an adulterous wife by taking her back. And we all know how hard it can be to love sinners and live with them, right? But you realize who you really are, don't you? You're right. I'm here to tell you, you were Gomer. Regardless of all the ways that you compare your righteousness with the people of this world, perhaps, or with even other people in churches, and you might look pretty good, but when you compare yourself with God, 
on what he has called you to be. Oh, it's plain. It's clear. You are Gomer. You and I are the unfaithful objects of God's ever faithful love. And only when we really understand that's who we are do we understand what biblical love is. So may God grant us grace-centered lives of faith, hope, and love. Gomer's only hope was in a love that she never deserved. Friend, that's our only hope as well. And that's the message of Hosea. Let's pray. Oh God, as we sit and hear these words of warning, words of judgment, words of doom and despair, Oh, God, we want to run and hide. But may we also hear the call to repent. And may you grant grace that we will repent and look to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God, and give us hearts that in spite of the wickedness around us and the depth of despair in people's lives, the darkness that envelops us on regular occasions, may our hearts be fixed on the light and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our stay. And may we cast ourselves on your mercy find joy in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 